Imagine being from a culture that venerates suicide as an expression of honor, loyalty, and courage, and failing at it. That's right, you wouldn't think so, but many of the kamikaze pilots of World War II Japan didn't quite make it, or decided they really didn't want to end their lives. For many years after the war, these men tried to hide their World War II shame. When they couldn't, they were called cowards, disloyal, and a disgrace to their families and Japan. But over 3,000 kamikaze pilots did succeed in killing themselves. Unfortunately, some managed to take about 7,000 sailors, marines, soldiers, and airmen with them. Luckily, however, historians estimate that only about 19% of kamikaze attacks were successful, or that death toll would have been much, much higher. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine the horrifying fate of kamikaze pilots who returned home. During World War II, the Japanese weren't the only ones to kill themselves in attempts to destroy the enemy. It likely happened more frequently than we can ever know. But these deaths usually came when a man took their lives and those of an attacking enemy, because all chance of survival was gone or because he knew that his death was the only way to save others. By the way, it wasn't only men. Perhaps the most famous case involving women happened on the Eastern Front, when a female sniper team near Novgorod, wounded and out of ammo, waited for German soldiers to get close and then blew themselves up with grenades, taking the German soldiers with them. But let's be honest, there's one country in particular that became known for suicide attacks, and that's Japan. By 1944, Anyone with a bit of sense could see that Japan was going to lose World War II. Unfortunately, much of the Japanese leadership could not bring themselves to see the truth. The United States and its allies were getting stronger by the day, and the Japanese were getting weaker. It was just a matter of time. Still, many Japanese military leaders and a large portion of the population believed that it was possible to prevent an invasion of Japan by taking as many Allied lives as possible and in the process of doing so, hoped to cause the Allies to offer peace terms because they would realize that the cost of carrying on the war was too great. The plan makes sense from a certain angle, but the Japanese didn't know two things, that the Americans were working on the atomic bomb, and that even if the bomb wasn't developed or didn't work, the Allies were invading the Japanese home islands, no matter the cost. As an effort to organize thousands of men, and a small number of women into a suicide corps, there was only one name that could be given, Kamikaze, Divine Wind. The name went back 700 years in Japanese history to the attempted invasions of Japan by the Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan, whose huge fleet was destroyed not once but twice by terrific typhoons as they lay anchor off the Japanese coast. To the Japanese, the gods themselves saved them by sending a divine wind to destroy the enemy. And this time, the divine wind would save Japan again. This is what was facing Japan in 1944-1945. First, take the size of the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. Just the U.S. Navy, not the ships of Great Britain, Holland, and Australia that also made up the Allies' naval force in Asia. The U.S. Pacific Fleet was divided into smaller fleets. Just the Fifth Fleet alone was bigger than any other nation's navy by early 1945. The entire Pacific Fleet was made up of the Third, the Fifth, the Ninth, and a number of other smaller formations, was bigger than all of the other navies in the world combined. And that did not take into account U.S. naval forces in the Atlantic, which were going to be shifted to the Pacific once Hitler was defeated. By early 1945, the Japanese Navy was all but destroyed. Japanese submarines were still a threat, but more subs were being sunk by the day. The Japanese merchant fleet was almost non-existent. They had been sent to the bottom by U.S. submarines, who were now operating so close to the Japanese mainland that they were taking pictures of the Japanese coast through their periscope. The Japanese were so desperate for supplies at home that they resorted to wooden sampans, a type of sailboat, to carry them, and bored U.S. submariners were sinking those too. The last gasp of the Japanese Imperial Navy came during the Battle of Leyte Gulf in the Philippines in late October 1944. 
In a bold move, the Japanese brought all of the naval forces they could muster for what they hoped would be one last decisive battle that would prevent the Allies from retaking the Philippines and in the process destroy a large portion of the Allied fleet. Though the numbers suggested that the battle would be a close one, a number of factors, including incredible bravery on the part of the U.S. sailors of Task Force Taffy 3 and Japanese misjudgment, caused the battle to end in a catastrophic Japanese defeat. Before the battle, a number of Japanese officers and pilots decided that it would be more effective if they crashed their planes into Allied ships, rather than attempt to dodge a maneuver through the gunfire, not only of the ships, but of the hundreds of Allied planes. Flying their planes in excess of 300 miles an hour without having to slow down to turn or climb, loaded with one or two large bombs and aviation fuel would be more effective than engaging in dogfights while trying to get the Allied ships. Besides, by this time, the vast majority of Japanese pilots were inexperienced youngsters. The Americans had shot down most everyone else. 71 sailors on the Santee and 107 sailors on the Suwani were killed and hundreds were wounded. By the time the Americans were ready to invade the Japanese island of Okinawa in April 1945, the Japanese Imperial Army had organized and recruited thousands of kamikaze pilots. Many of the first men to join the ranks of the kamikaze went willingly, but as tales of the brutal treatment that took place during their flight training began to spread, more and more of the men in the kamikaze were forced into it, though they were still depicted as glorious volunteers. Many of the kamikaze were indeed eager to give their lives for Japan and its emperor, and even those who were somewhat reluctant at first did take pride in the fact that they would be sacrificing themselves for their country, family, and way of life. But there were also quite a few that didn't want any part of what was happening and tried to avoid being recruited by the armed secret police who combed through Japanese cities looking for young volunteers. It's a myth that the kamikaze flight was always a one-way trip. The Pacific Ocean is huge, and though the Japanese had a general idea of where the Allies were, and this included the land forces of the Soviet Union attacking the Japanese in China at the end of the war, the enemy couldn't always be found. Sometimes, targets presented themselves that were relatively small and inconsequential, like freighters or repair vessels. Many kamikaze returned to base for another try, with the hope that they would find a battleship or aircraft carrier to plow into and sink. Some pilots, however, returned to base to fly another day too often. One man returned nine times. On his last landing, he was pulled from the cockpit and shot. Because of their inexperience, many other pilots never returned. Not because they crashed into a ship, but because they couldn't find any and ran out of fuel. Or they got lost over the ocean, never to be seen again. On April 1st, 1945, the United States began the invasion of Okinawa, the last great battle of World War II and the largest effort by the kamikaze pilots. The Allied fleet consisted of an unreal number of ships, 18 battleships, 39 aircraft carriers of all types, 177 destroyers and destroyer escorts, 27 cruisers, and hundreds of support ships. Hindsight is 2020, and there was no way for the Japanese to know that the Americans were never going to stop their planned invasion of Japan and that they were developing a superweapon. But even if you compare the number of kamikaze pilots to the number of ships and the thousands of Allied aircraft in the fleet, there was no way the Japanese would have succeeded, even if all of them were able to strike a target, which they were not. Still, Allied veterans of the sea battle off Okinawa often said that the kamikaze were the most terrifying thing they faced in the war. In a normal battle, enemy aircraft would have turned away from such a large force blasting incredible amounts of lead into the sky, or at least retreated after they spent their ammunition, bombs, or torpedoes. But not the kamikaze. They kept coming at tremendous speed. The Japanese also tried to strike from two particularly different angles, striking down from very high, or skirting the waves to strike the hull of a ship, especially the larger ones. The most important targets were aircraft carriers, battleships, and cruisers. But these were well defended, either by heavy armor, hundreds of guns, and much of the Allied air power. To defend these important ships, the Americans sent their smaller and faster destroyers and destroyer escorts out in a circle around the fleet, as an early warning system and for defense. All of the ships sunk or damaged were these escort ships, as well as support ships. 
Though many kamikaze did strike a number of the larger vessels, their hits were either glancing blows at heavily armored parts of the vessels, or they were simply too big for one, two, or three suicide planes to destroy. When the Battle of Okinawa was over, the toll from the kamikaze was heavy but not decisive. 36 American ships sent to the bottom, more than 300 more damaged, almost 500 sailors killed and nearly the same amount wounded. The Japanese lost 1,600 planes and pilots off Okinawa. In the end, the kamikaze did ensure one thing. There wouldn't be an invasion of the Japanese mainland. The determination of the kamikaze persuaded most of the American leadership that an invasion could cost millions of American and Japanese lives. They decided to drop the bomb instead. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.